her life very, very difficult. Eventually, she wrote to the FEPC, and this is how we have the record of it. Uh, she says, quote, I am now scaling, meaning she's cleaning the hulls of ships. I am now scaling. It is hard work, but our crew is mixed, and we are all treated alike. Why couldn't the same be said for the skilled workers? Why couldn't the same be said for the skilled workers? Eventually, labor shortages and production demands broke down somewhat, somewhat, this arcane racial classification. But most black workers remained in unskilled work for the rest of the war. Let me repeat that. Most black workers remained in unskilled work for the rest of the war. Two barriers were rarely ever crossed. In one instance, black men and black women, regardless of education or experience, did not become clerical workers or, in, another instance, in other instances, they did not become supervisors. In other words, they couldn't work in the office, they couldn't handle the paperwork in the office, and they could not become supervisors. As a matter of fact, one of the shipyard managers spoke to that very question in 1944. Uh, he, had just, uh, he had just established a system whereby blacks could, could head all black crews, but then he argued that blacks should never supervise whites. And then he said it like this, we wouldn't ask white people to work under a Negro, and we shouldn't expect them to. We wouldn't ask white people to work under a Negro, and we shouldn't expect them to. In other words, in other words there was progress, and then there was, there was not. In other words, there was progress. Uh, black people were working in, in jobs that they had never had before, the kinds of jobs they never had before. They were making a great deal of money, and they were certainly in many instances outside of the South. But racial discrimination still existed. Marginalization still existed, even in what were considered to be some of the best jobs in the country. After jobs, housing was the greatest challenge facing black workers in Portland, especially the migrants. And you can understand the situation. As I said before, about 1,900 blacks lived in Portland, and mostly in the Albina district. And, and I don't know how many of you are familiar with Albina. It's now called Northeast Portland. Uh, those 1,900 blacks lived in Albina before the war, and they lived essentially in a mixed area. That is, there were whites in Albina as well, but blacks could only live in Albina. Whites could live anywhere in town. They could move out of Albina. Uh, blacks could not because of restrictive covenants. And of course, what happens then is that all of these newcomers come in, and the restrictive covenants still hold, and as a result, there's a doubling and tripling up in the city. Now, to be sure, everybody in Portland was going to be crowded. In other words, Portland's population went from about 300,000 to 400,000 uh, in, the, in the four years of the war, and so there were a lot of people who were sleeping uh, and living under atrocious conditions. But for black folks who already suffered from the restrictive covenants, the situation was going to be even worse. Black folks were living essentially in garages when they, when they got a chance, and the garages were the better facilities. Uh, they, were, they were sleeping in churches, because the churches sometimes opened their doors to them. Uh, they, they were sleeping in basements when, when they were lucky enough to have basements. And in some instances, black folks, uh, black workers were actually living in chicken coops. Now it's amazing because these people were making more money than they'd ever made before. So money wasn't the issue. The fact that they were making money, unfortunately, did not negate uh, the, the inability of these folks to find, uh, to find suitable housing. The situation became so very bad that Henry Kaiser stepped in again. And he decided that he wanted to, to try to alleviate the, the housing shortage by actually building houses because he realized that without housing, he couldn't get the workers that he needed or could, the workers wouldn't stay and therefore the ships wouldn't be built. But unfortunately, Kaiser ran into opposition from the city, civic leaders in Portland, the business leaders in Portland, who said that they didn't want public housing. And as a result, Kaiser again had to go to the White House. He had to go to the President of the United States and get a special dispensation to create a remarkable community that would be known eventually as Vanport. Uh, these, these are images from Vanport. And just to put a perspective on this, Vanport would be the world's largest war housing city. In other words, it would be the largest single housing project built anywhere in the world, as far as we can determine, unless there's something in the Soviet Union that we don't know about, anywhere in the world uh, in, in the World War II period. To put it in perspective, Vanport would eventually have 42,000 inhabitants or residents, and as such, it would become the second largest city in Oregon, second only to Portland itself. 
Vanport, as I said before, was the nation's largest wartime housing facility, and actually this is proof. You can see the number of units that were built uh, by the federal government for the Kaiser workers, and you can see them in comparison to much larger cities. Los Angeles and New York, of course, pale in comparison uh, to what was going to take place in Vanport. But let me give you an example, or let me give you kind of a reminder of the scale of this community that's established uh, essentially uh, in the lowlands between, between Vancouver and North Portland. 10,000 prefabricated housing units were gonna be built in less than a year to house the workers in Vanport. Interestingly, one third of the construction workers who built these houses were women. This virtually self-contained city had five grade schools, six nursery schools, and eventually it had Vanport College out of which emerged Portland State University. Vanport also had three fire stations, a US post office, a police station, a movie theater, a 130 bed hospital, a library, and 16 playgrounds. In other words, this really, this really was a community. Uh, and it was a community that, uh, how will I say this? It was a community that tried to come to grips with race. There were attempts to try to integrate facilities, as you can see here, this Bible study class, but also there was an informal segregation, housing segregation going on, uh, because virtually all of the blacks were by custom, not by law, but by custom, confined to the south end of the, of the Vanport area along Cottonwood Avenue. By 1945, half of Portland's 22,000 black residents resided in the city of Portland, and the other half were in Vanport. Whether they lived in Portland proper or Vanport, uh, that is in the housing project in Vanport, they were racially segregated. That is, the housing was racially segregated. A Portland Urban League official made the linkage between segregated housing and societal well-being when he declared in 1945, a man who must crowd his wife and children into an unsafe and unsanitary home becomes an unstable citizen. Becomes an unstable citizen. Restrictive covenants, of course, were the cause of deteriorating housing. And the covenants had existed long before World War II, and they existed not just in Portland. As you're going to see, they existed in Seattle and a whole host of other cities across the country. There were three solutions to this situation. The first solution would be for the community, the white community, to have reduced or eliminated its opposition to the black presence and allowed blacks to live anywhere in the city. In other words, residential integration. But I'll be honest with you, that was the option that was least likely to happen in the 1940s. The second option was to build more public housing in Portland, not just the Vanport community, but to build public housing and disperse it throughout Portland. However, Portland officials, supported by the Chamber of Commerce and other civic groups, discouraged the construction of new housing. They were already angry that, that Kaiser had gotten Vanport, and they drew the line and said there will be no other, uh, no other significant public housing projects in Portland. And essentially, they made the argument, it was very, very clear, they, they made the argument that if we build public housing, we literally invite the blacks, and in some instances, the southern whites, to stay. As one city official remarked in 1945, he and his colleagues, quote, wished that most of the Negroes would go back home, leaving our city untouched by racial problems. And of course, the way to affect that is to deny the, the Negroes housing. And remember I said before that there's a reason the black population increased to 22,000 and then declined. I think one of the reasons it declined is obviously because the shipyards themselves closed down. But I think another reason for that decline was that Portland city officials, and of course in many instances, ordinary citizens in Portland, made it very, very clear that black folks were not welcome. They made it very clear that African Americans were not welcome. And some of those blacks ended up coming up here to Seattle. Some of them ended up coming, going, going down to Los Angeles. They, they went everywhere uh, except to stay in Portland. But some did. Indeed, as you, you saw from the census figures earlier, about 9,000 black folks, uh, again, a 300% increase in the population, about 9,000 blacks would remain in Portland through the end of the year. They would, in effect, try to survive what I call the housing crisis, but a housing crisis that in some ways was contrived, a housing crisis that in some ways was orchestrated in order to keep African Americans out of the city. And, but they, even the city fathers, wouldn't be and couldn't be, couldn't possibly be prepared for Mother Nature. They couldn't possibly be prepared for Mother Nature. On Memorial Day, 
in 1948, there was a flood that literally wiped away, washed away the Vanport community. Uh, I don't know how many of you have heard of the Vanport flood, uh, but it was, it was horrible, it was horrendous, and I'll, I'll give you some, some illustrations here. This is, uh, this is the damage. You can see these are prefabricated houses and they are taken away. A dike uh, broke along the Columbia River. There was flooding you know, along the river, the dike broke. Jesus, sounds like Katrina. <laughs> and, and essentially the water rushed in and you can see the damage. You can see the tremendous damage. Although this is not Katrina because it's on a much smaller scale, it is Katrina in terms of the impact on the community. And I'll give you, I'll give you some visual uh, representation. Of this. You can see the people streaming. And these are lucky. These are lucky people. Only, we don't know exactly how many people died, but the best estimate is about uh, 15 people uh, died in Vanport. But there are, there are other estimates that the number was far higher because a lot of people's bodies were never recovered. You can see, you can see uh, people trying to get out. And, and as I took these pictures, as I did these scans, I, I could almost, you know, I could almost sense that we're doing Katrina again, uh, that, that essentially this was kind of a precursor to what would happen in New Orleans later. This is my editorial comment, guys, but I just want, want to throw that in. And of course, the flood and the aftermath. It would take years, it would take years before many of these people would be readjusted into uh, the Portland community. Uh, right there at the bottom, you can see the Red Cross. And here you can see very clearly the Red Cross helping both blacks and whites. And you can see, notice this is not just about black folks. There are white folks who are also going to be uh, made homeless by the flood. And as I said, it would take years, uh, perhaps even a decade, before many of these people were going, going to have their lives restored as a consequence, as a consequence of this flood. In other words, this was, this was in some ways a parallel to, obviously one couldn't predict uh, Katrina, but this was in many ways a parallel to what would happen in New Orleans. I was struck by this as I, as I tried to organize these slides. But the larger point here is that black folks had come to the West, they had come to the Pacific Northwest, specifically they had come to Portland, and they had come to an uncertain welcome. And with that, let me talk about of Seattle, and I'm going to try to shorten this to some extent because a lot of what happened in Portland, at least in terms of blacks getting to, to, the, to the scene, is, uh, is going to be duplicated in Seattle, except maybe on a slightly smaller scale. Blacks, of course, come to Seattle initially to work in the shipyard industries, not Boeing, but to work in the shipyards. Uh, and of course, there are a number of shipyards. I think we've, we've forgotten our shipbuilding heritage uh, here in Seattle, but we were a major port for, for ship, or a major area for shipbuilding in the 1940s, at least through the World War II period as well. Uh, but by 1943, the focus of black employment is going to shift, just as the focus of employment for most workers is going to shift to Boeing. Boeing is going to be the major employer. And, I, and look at that, that image on the right. I just want to comment on that. That's a remarkable scene. That, this is the war bond rally at, at Boeing Field in 1943. I don't, you know, it's hard to imagine a scene like that even, to, even today. Now, maybe it could happen, but I, I think we've rarely seen anything like this. But, but this shows you the tremendous impact that Boeing has on, on the local economy. These are workers, and they're obviously not all of the workers at Boeing, but these are workers uh, at Boeing in the middle of, of World War II. By 19, by, as I said, by 1943, most African Americans who were coming to Seattle were coming to work at Boeing. By the end of the war, 4,000 black folks worked in the, uh, in the shipyards out of 60,000 workers, and 1,200 of 4,200, well, excuse me, 42,000 aircraft construction workers in Seattle were African American. Of course, in Seattle, when we talk about aircraft con construction, that's all Boeing. Despite this labor, despite the shortage of workers in Seattle's defense industries, some industrialists and some labor leaders opposed the hiring of African Americans. This is labor power. This is the march of the Boeing Union, the Aero Mechanics Union, Local 751, and I want to talk about 751 in a minute. But again, it's a remarkable scene that I don't think will be duplicated anytime soon in the streets of Seattle. But these are, these are workers uh, uh, marching to Seattle City Hall. Notice they're not marching on Boeing, they're marching on City Hall, and they're marching for political reasons as much as economic reasons, and it reflects on the tremendous power of the, of the Boeing workforce in the city at that moment. But unfortunately, that Boeing workforce was divided, at least initially, at least initially, 
about whether African Americans will be included among them. As a matter of fact, uh, after Executive Order 8802, the Northwest Enterprise, which of course was the late leading black newspaper in Seattle, uh, essentially continued. Notice I didn't say it began. It continued its campaign to try to integrate Boeing. As a matter of fact, the newspaper said in, in September 26 of 1941, this is what, three months uh, after the executive order, the president's memorandum issued to quiet the rising tide of Negroes' protests falls on deaf ears in the far Northwest. And the newspaper had good reason for that pessimism uh, in, in 1941. Boeing in its 25 year history had never hired an African American for any capacity, not even as a janitor. Moreover, that pattern seemed unlikely to change. In the 10 week period after Executive Order 8802 became law, the company hired 1,000 new employees per week, but none of them were African American. Not a single one was an African American. In response to this, the black community, the small black community organized. The black churches, the fraternal organizations, the political clubs organized uh, a, a, a committee, what I think the longest name in African American history, the Committee for the Defense of the Negro's Right to Work at Boeing Airplane Company. <laughs> Uh, but you know the idea. The idea was to, was to try to get political change. The idea was to use the, uh, the might of the federal government on one hand, to use the power of the African American community on the other, to try to integrate Local 751, which was the International Association of Machinists or the Aero Mechanics Union. Ultimately, pressure from the committee, uh, pressure from the federal government, and most importantly, the growing labor shortage forced Boeing and the Aircraft Workers Union local 751, to allow the first black production workers at the Seattle Aircraft Plant in the spring of 1942. Nonetheless, some union leaders were still displeased that even the temporary, and this was called at that time a temporary opening, the temporary opening of Boeing uh, to black workers and other people of color and to women. And only, only because of the huge labor shortage was something done. Uh, James Duncan, a representative for Local 751 of the International Association of Machinists, said this, we have officially gone on record as agreeing to live up to the letter and spirit of the executive order. At the same time, we rather resent that the war situation has been used to alter an old established custom and do not feel it would be helpful to war production. The old established custom is racial discrimination, guys, in case, in case you didn't know. And, and they said this wouldn't be helpful uh, for war production. Let me make a footnote, let me make an aside to this, and it's a very important aside. There was the, the committee with the long name, that is of African Americans who were working to try to integrate Boeing from outside. But there was also a group of men, and all men, remember, because Boeing didn't have any female workers, production workers at that time. There were a group of men within the union who were trying to integrate the union as well. Some called them communists. I don't know if they were or not, but that was an easy charge to level because these were, these were individuals who were dedicated to trying to, to change the pattern of racial discrimination. And one of those people was Hugo Lundquist. And you can't tell, well, you may not be able to tell, but go, look, go, go to the very top of that image. You see the man speaking out the window? That's Lundquist, and he, he's addressing members of Local 741. And essentially, I use this image to show you that there, there's actually a battle going on within the union. That is, there are those within the union who are trying to integrate it from the inside, just as though there are those who are struggling from the outside to try to integrate the union. Unfortunately for Lundquist and the others who were trying to integrate the union, they were going to be accused of being communists. There was going to be a trial of these men. And they, there were other charges that were brought against them as well. But one of the issues was the fact that they were trying to, to integrate the union. And as a result, they were expelled. As a result, they were expelled. That, fortunately, was not the end of it. Because by 1942, by 1942, the labor shortage uh, would eventually allow African Americans uh, to work in Boeing. And I want to go to the next slide. This is Dorothy West Williams. She is the first production worker at the Boeing Airplane Company in 1942. And I think it's significant that the very first production worker was a black woman. The very first of the blacks who worked in production was a black woman. And indeed, this would be the situation in Boeing throughout those years throughout the World War II years. To give you some statistics on this, by, 1940, by July of 1943, African American women constituted 86% of the 329 black employees at Boeing. 
In other words, this was a female workforce. These were women who were going to work to build, to build the planes, to build the B-17 bombers, and eventually uh, the B-25 bombers that, that would be so effective in, in destroying the Nazis and uh, eventually forcing the Japanese to surrender. Wartime job demands had finally broken seven decades of an employment pattern in Seattle. We're not talking about the rest of the country, but in Seattle, uh, where the majority of black workers, and particularly black women, were unskilled laborers and specifically domestic servants. As one African-American woman said, uh, and, and she's talking about black women at Boeing, and this is, I want to talk about this image in a minute. It was Hitler who got us out of white folks' kitchens. It was Hitler who got us out of white folks' kitchens. I think that was a profound statement. I, I want to talk about this image. This is, just as an aside, I know we're always pressed for time here, but I, I want to say something about this. This is an image that was lost to all of us, that was lost to historians, lost to the community until about a year and a half ago. The, uh, the, the union, the IAM union, was tearing down its old building, and in the process of, of the, uh, the, the demolition, demolition uh, a, a, a cache of old photographs was found, and this was one of those photographs. This is a remarkable photograph. It shows black women standing in front of the plane, the type of plane that they built, that they helped to build in 1944. And it shows the role of African-American women uh, in the Boeing company at that time. African-Americans were discriminated against even in the Boeing factory, uh, just as they continue to be discriminated against uh, in the factories, the shipyards, I should say, in, in Portland. But nonetheless, African-Americans in Seattle gained enormous prestige from receiving high wage paying jobs. In other words, Boeing paid more than the shipyards. As a matter of fact, the shipyard employers were upset because Boeing paid more. Uh, and from knowing that they were holding down jobs that were comparable to those held by, by whites and from knowing that, that indeed they were part of the movement or part of the, the effort to try to bring about the destruction of the Nazis and, and to protect and literally save the United States. But I want to, I, before I leave the discussion of Boeing, I want to show this other slide. And this shows the other side. Not only are African Americans being changed by what's going on in Boeing, but the rest of society is being changed as well. This is Inez Sawyer. I don't know if she's a typical worker, but read her words, because they show something about the way in which the war and the close proximity of these black and white, white women uh, in the workplace is, is in effect challenging age-old customs, age-old ideas about the proper place of African Americans and other people of color in society. Boeing provided good jobs, and that's, that's obviously a plus. Boeing provided the opportunity for African Americans to make a substantial amount of money, even though, again, there was, there was a housing shortage in Seattle, just as it existed in Portland and else, elsewhere. But good jobs at high wages could still not prevent the rise of racial tension. And there was a tremendous amount of racial tension uh, in Seattle as it was all over the country. Now in the rest of the country, that racial tension spilled over into violence. This is Detroit. This is the image that a lot of African Americans remember all too well. Detroit had the worst race ride as far as African Americans were concerned. The ra worst race ride was probably the Zoot Suit ride, but, but the Detroit had the worst race ride in the country in 1943, but not the only one not the only one. Detroit was in some ways kind of representative of the growing tensions because essentially what you have are African-American workers who are coming, either coming to places like Detroit and Seattle and establishing themselves, um, establishing their presence as workers with, a, with their sense of equality uh, and going against, again, those age-old practices of discrimination, going against those who decided that African-Americans should remain in their place. And of course, this tension would grow in Seattle. And I want to speak to this. Actually, I want to let you read what a Seattle mayor spoke, uh, said about this in 1944. This is, the, this is Seattle Mayor William F. Devon. Uh, Devon actually created the Seattle Civic Unity Committee, which was an organization, a remarkable organization, uh, to try to bring people together and, and to, do, to do so in a way to reduce racial tensions. We don't know the whole story, but, but what little we can piece together suggests that there were many riots, in other words, small riots, in the shipyards, at the Boeing plant, and certainly there were confrontations between blacks and whites 
on street buses and in downtown Seattle uh, in 1943, 1944, 1945. That's kind of a hidden history. A lot of us find, would find it hard to imagine that this was going on in Seattle. And yet you can see the words of, of the mayor. He knew it was going on and he had to address it at, at that time. As, this, as you can see, and I'll, you, I'll read his last words. If we don't do that, that is if we don't deal with this issue of race, we shall not exist very long as a civilized city or as a nation. As a civilized city or as a nation. And why is he speaking to this? Because there is a problem. Not only is there racial tension, but there are also growing manifestations of racial discrimination. For instance, for the first time, at least in the memory of the old residents, we catered to white trade only signs began to appear in stores in Seattle. This is something that a lot of people thought was sort of <laughs> limited to the South, limited to the East. Now these kinds of signs were beginning to pop up in Seattle, and, and of course, this was disturbing. There were other examples of racial discrimination, and indeed, the Northwest Enterprise was going to do important work to try to root out this discrimination all over. Look at these headlines. Well, I, I like the one. Jim Crow parades Madrona Theater. Can you imagine a, a theater in Madrona excluding black folks? <laughs> it's, hard, it's hard to imagine, but that's exactly what the situation was uh, in World War II. And, and you can see what's going on. Protests, NAACP protests segregation on Pasco buses. You didn't have to go very far. The situation in Bremerton. You didn't have to go very far to see examples of racial discrimination. But you also didn't have to go very far to see a lot of people, a lot of good people, white, black, uh, Asian, who were coming to defend against uh, that kind of discrimination. We talk, for instance, about the NAACP, and the NAACP was certainly in the forefront of this defense against discrimination. The NAACP led the campaign. But there was one interesting, almost remarkable organization that emerges in Seattle that needs to be mentioned in the struggle as well, and that was the Christian Friends for Racial Equality. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this. I know some of us are familiar with the Christian Friends. The Christian Friends was, was started uh, by uh, a group of concerned citizens, a group of people who were concerned about the growing racial tension. These were, these were white and, and black folks who were concerned. Uh, one of the people who was instrumental in, in, in the organization in his very early years was none other than Dorothy Bullock. Uh, you know, my chair is named after her, and, and I didn't, and I have to confess to you, I thought for a long time that Dorothy Bullitt was a, a socialite, was a, a, uh, essentially a, a club woman. I didn't realize that she was one of the most powerful businesswomen in Seattle until I, I, I came here. And that shows my ignorance and I will confess to all about that. What I did realize though, was that she spoke up early against racial discrimination. That she was one of the people that wanted to be counted uh, in the campaign. Now, did she do enough? Did any of these folks do enough? Who knows? But what we do know is that at a time when most people were turning a deaf ear to this, at a time when most people weren't getting engaged in the campaign against racial discrimination, the, 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 the fr Christian Friends for Racial Equality uh, were stepping forward. Uh, this is, as I said, this is a unique organization. They were larger even than the NAACP, and they were involved in campaigns as significant as the NAACP, not just in the 1940s, but through the 1950s. As a matter of fact, I think uh, they finally disbanded in the early, in the early 1960s. Uh, as in Portland, African American newcomers face chronic housing shortages, and of course the housing shortages were, as always, exacerbated by restrictive covenants. Uh, the restrictive covenants essentially forced 10,000 black folks in Seattle to live in accommodations that had, that had been designed to hold about 3,500. And so obviously there's, there's uh, the doubling up, obviously there's the tension that comes from this. But Seattle is, is remarkable in the sense that there was one visionary individual, a man named Jesse Epstein, who directed the Seattle Housing Authority, who almost by sheer will, almost by sheer defiance, said, we are not going to allow segregation in Yesler Terrace. Yesler Terrace, as many of you may know, is the, one of the oldest public housing projects in the country. Or maybe you don't know that. It is one of the oldest public housing projects in the country. It is also, it also holds the distinction of being one of the few integrated housing projects in the country. Uh, Jesse Epstein was involved in a great social experiment, and I, these are his words, not mine. 
uh, but involved in a great social experiment to try to make sure that there would at least be one public housing project in Seattle. Not all of the projects were integrated, but to make sure that one project would be, would be integrated. And you can see, well, you can see to some extent the consequences of this. This is extremely unusual. This is extraordinary in a time when almost the, all of the rest of the country was going in the opposite direction. African-American Seattle was itself bitterly divided over the influx of the migrants. There were, as I said before, the old settlers, uh, the, the people who had arrived before December 7th, 1941, and of course, there were the newcomers, the migrants. Uh, and of course, the newcomers generated all kinds of images, most of which, at least in the minds of the old settlers, were negative. The newcomers were the sharecroppers. The newcomers were the folks up from the south. Look carefully at these images, because, because, because I'm sort of playing with them for a minute. You see on the left and on the right, these are clearly black folks. The people in the middle are actually white. The people in the middle, that's a white couple in the middle. But when, when most folks talked about the migrants and all that the migrants stood for and all that they represented, they were almost always, almost invariably, talking about African Americans. African Americans were seen as the people who were, quote, culturally foreign because they had come from somewhere else and because they didn't know the ways of the city. And of course, this created a tremendous, a tremendous amount of tension. Listen to the words of Lietta King, one of, the, one of the black women in Seattle at the time. I know that I was quite ashamed of them. They looked so bad. The women wearing dungarees and their heads tied up with a handkerchief. I just tried not to see them. And of course, there are numerous quotes like this. Old settlers resented these people coming in, as you can see here. They thought that the situation for all black folks would be made worse by these newcomers. Uh, they believed that somehow or another the delicate balance of, of, of race would be upset, permanently upset, permanently altered by the newcomers. Well, in that regard, they were right. In that regard, they were right. But they assumed that they would somehow or another suffer uh, because of this. As another old timer said, Melvina Squires, these people were pretty conspicuous, meaning the newcomers, the migrants. These people were pretty conspicuous. They were loud, they were happy, they were crude. And of course, that was, that was juxtaposed against the image of the settlers, uh, or the old settlers, or the blacks who had been here all, for a long time. I will say, though, that not every one of the old settlers felt this way. Listen to the words of Armetta Hess uh, in a 1968 interview. She's describing what I call the myopia of a lot of her contemporaries. She said, we're always talking, we were always talking about these sharecroppers, these sharecroppers. We're all sharecroppers. We just got here first. <laughs> the migrants had their own set of grievances against, uh, uh, against the, uh, the old settlers. The migrants felt that the old settlers hadn't done enough to fight for civil rights. They felt that the old settlers had been too quiet on questions of, of racial discrimination. And they certainly believed that, the, that this notion of racial progress and the notion of good race relations was grossly exaggerated. And they believed that it was grossly exaggerated, not simply because they had come, but because essentially the old settlers had been too passive, too willing to accept uh, the old standard. Eventually, the mutual hostility between the old settlers and the migrants faded. Community leaders created the Association for Tolerance, which operated out of the two leading black churches in September of 1943. And the Association for Tolerance was created, quote, for the purpose of orienting our new residents into our way of life. The migration of the 1940s altered the racial configuration of Seattle, making blacks, for the first time in the city's history, the largest racial minority. That is, they replaced Japanese Americans. And of course, we know Japanese Americans uh, were removed from the city <laughs> you know, in 1941, 1942. But, but even, had there been the, even had the Japanese population remained in the city, blacks would have been the overwhelming majority. Blacks would have outnumbered them. Uh, and of course, there's a problem. There's an unfortunate corollary to, uh, to the coming of blacks it, particularly blacks who, in many instances, had no experience with the Japanese. Now, I don't want to go too far with this. I don't want to suggest that the African Americans and Japanese Americans had absolutely no tension between them before World War II. I think it would be naive to say that. But certainly, when you compare the situation in Los Angeles or San Francisco or Oakland, there was far less tension and far more cooperation between Japanese Americans in Seattle and blacks or African Americans in Seattle than in any of the other cities on the West Coast. Some of that, much of that, was shattered 
by World War II. As African Americans came in from the South, and to be honest with you, as African Americans sort of <laughs> absorbed the generalized racial discourse of the time that tended to demonize all Japanese people. Remember, we're fighting in a war against Imperial Japan, and there were the worst caricatures, I don't have examples of this, but there were the worst caricatures of the Japanese that you could imagine on buildings right here in downtown Seattle. You don't have to go very far to see these things. And as a result, there was a general rising of tension or an increase in tension against the Japanese. And of course, black people shared in these, these beliefs. Black people, in effect, became increasingly dismissive of the Japanese and ultimately of the Japanese Americans. As one, as one internee said when he returned uh, to Seattle, when he returned to his home on Jackson Street, he said, for the first time, uh, I felt persecuted, but the persecutors spoke in the accent of the persecuted. The persecutors spoke in the accent of the persecuted. In other words, he was saying that African Americans were now engaged in, in persecution of, of Japanese Americans. Fortunately, again, Seattle's model is different from that of the other cities. In the other cities, the tension continued to grow, and there seemed to be very little that anyone would do to stop it. But in Seattle, a remarkable organization, the, Jap uh, excuse me, the Jackson Street Community Council, was formed in 1946. Now, I don't say, I'm not going to stand here and say that the, the Jackson Street Community Council was formed to deal with racial tension. They were actually nothing more, nothing less than the typical neighborhood association that's concerned about getting the garbage picked up, concerned about police protection, concerned about making sure that all the members of the business association pay their dues and, and keep their stores up and all the rest. But in the process of doing so, they were engaged in what I call race work. They were engaged in work that would eventually result in the lowering of tensions between and among Asian Americans and African Americans. I won't get into all of the detail here, but I want to go to the next image, and I want to hold it up for a minute. The Jackson Street Community Council uh, would stage all these elaborate pageants. This is one in 1952, the crowning of Miss International Center. And in 1952, the first Miss International Center was Adele Avery, a black woman. And there was a conscious effort to try to essentially rotate the officers among, uh, among the, the Jackson Street Community Council, among uh, Filipino Americans, among Chinese Americans, among Japanese Americans, and of course among African Americans. Again, I don't know if they said they were doing this in order to try to eliminate the racial problem, but in the process of doing so, they were creating a model for interracial cooperation that would extend well into the 19, 1960s and, and beyond. The migration of African Americans to Seattle during World War II would continue into the post-war decade. Unlike Portland, where many black people left, indeed, Portland lost all, over half of its black population. Half of its 1945 black population had left the city by 1949, 1950. Just the opposite happened in Seattle. Seattle had 10,000 black folks in 1945. By 1950, it would have 15,000. Part of that has to do with, unfortunately, the Cold War. Part of it has to do with the fact that Boeing would continue to grow. Even though World War II was over, we were in the Cold War, by 19, certainly by 1947, 1948, and as, as a result, Boeing would prosper, and that Boeing prosperity would result in African Americans continuing to come to Seattle, and in many instances, either working for Boeing itself or, or working in a city that was made prosperous by Boeing. As a result, Seattle blacks seem to have a pretty good life. As a matter of fact, I want to bring up this next image. This is, this is, I think, a remarkable image at a number of levels. This is Our World magazine, and for those of you who don't know, this was a magazine that was the rival to Ebony. Unfortunately, they didn't survive. Ebony did, <laughs> okay? But they wrote about Seattle in August of 1951, and they said, literally, that this is the best place in the country for black folks. And they talked about uh, the kind of integrated uh, uh, living uh, facilities there, and what you see, the picture you see here is, what, what is it? This is Rainier Vista. Oh my. This is Rainier Vista. This is a completely different image of Rainier Vista that we would have in the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s. And of course, there are people working to try to bring back this image, those people who are trying to, to redevelop Rainier Vista to this day. But in, 19, in 1947, 1948, 1949, Rainier Vista was the example, kind of the model of a racially integrated uh, community. 
All of this, all of this augured well, all this spoke well for African Americans in Seattle. As I said, uh, other places uh, envied Seattle, the, the, the people in Chicago, the people at the Chicago Defender said the Seattle was the best place to come, and indeed urged blacks to leave Chicago, urged blacks to leave the South and come to Seattle. Not all of them did, obviously, because Seattle's population didn't grow that much. But the very fact that Seattle seemed, for one brief, brief moment, the promised land, uh, <laughs> tended to make national news at that point. Moreover, there were a number of what I call first. And I, you know, I guess I have some ambivalence about even talking about first, because when you talk about the first this person and the first that person, you're also talking about the long legacy of discrimination. But on the other hand, there were people who were going to, to move into areas or, or engage in activities that they hadn't engaged in before. And these are two of the first in Seattle. Thelma DeWitty, uh, the first school teacher, and John Prem, the first judge in 1950. Uh, these, are, these are remarkable individuals, but they are two of a number of individuals that are emerging at that particular time. This list could go on and on and on. There are probably about 12 names that I could, I could list here, but I won't do it in the interest of time. There was also political growth, and I'm glad Larry's in the back to, to hear this, uh, Larry Gossett, our uh, county councilman, because African Americans were increasingly active politically in the World War II period. Indeed, it was the migration that, that spurred that activity because it was a much larger black community. In January 1946, Reverend F. Benjamin Davis, and by the way, here he is in the middle of this, this slide, and I love that outfit he has on. <laughs> but Reverend F. Benjamin Davis, the pastor of Mount Zion, enters the race for a city council seat. With the endorsement of organized labor, Davis garners 27,000 votes in a city that had only 3,500 black voters. He lost his council bid, but just barely. But nonetheless, he set the stage, or he proved the point, that African Americans could run successfully in a predominantly white city. He proved that African Americans could actually gain votes uh, from people outside of the African American community. And of course, the man who would prove this even more so was Republican attorney Charles Stokes. We saw him at the very beginning. Charles Stokes was elected to the 37th legislative seat, and he became the city's first African American representative in Olympia. Seattle's expanding economy, based in the early 1950s on defense spending, prompted by the Cold War, and again, the kind of the, the, the paradox here, you know, the tension in the world generates prosperity for Seattle that some African Americans benefit from, uh, seemed, created a city that seemed capable of absorbing all of these white and black newcomers. The economic growth, however, unfortunately, hid a lot of growing problems. There was a rising tide of segregation in the public schools. We won't talk about that tonight, but I'm certainly gonna spend a lot of time on that next week. There was growing poverty even in the midst of prosperity, and there was a growing concentration of black folks in the central district. In other words, the ghetto was increasing. It was not, it was not declining in any, any, by any respect, in any regard at that time. And indeed, the euphoria about Seattle's race relations would ultimately be challenged in the late 1950s and the early 1960s by what I call the civil rights movement, the civil rights movement right here in Seattle. But that, folks, is another lecture, next week's lecture, and so we'll stop at this point. Thank you very much.